Hello, everyone. On today's episode, we're bringing back on the show the very popular Phi Tax Guy, Sean Mullaney, and we're going to be looking at the four backstops to the 4% rule. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Guys, very excited to dive into this week's episode and help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well. Yeah, this is this should be a really good episode. So Sean wrote this amazing article, The Four Backstops to the 4% Rule. And it was something we knew we wanted to have him on to talk through. Because it's really, it's something, obviously, we talk about the 4% rule here fairly often, the 4% rule of thumb, as we call it. But we don't really dive into the nuance. And I think that's what Sean's article does so, so well. So yeah, with that, Sean, welcome back to Choose the Vine. Jonathan, Brad, always great to join you. Look forward to this conversation. Awesome, brother. Well, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think probably to start with, let's do a little bit of definition of terms just to make sure we're, uh, you know, everybody's caught up and understands why we're diving into the nuance. The 4% rule. Why is this term important for people that are, you know, trying to be strategic with their intermediate financial goals? So, Jonathan, all of us at some point need to face the prospect of not working, right? So there's this debate in the FIRE community. Is it FI or is it FIRE, right? And the retire early. Well, at some point, all of us are going to have some desire or some need to not work, right? And many in the FI community would like that to be sooner rather than later. So you have all sorts of different levels of, hey, I'm going to need to withdraw financial assets to support me because I'm not going to have a W-2 job or self-employment or whatever it is, right? And then you guys have talked about the 4% rule many a time on the Choose a Five podcast. And as Brad mentioned, it is just a general rule of thumb, but it is a powerful one, right? If we think about accumulating 25 times our annual expenses in financial assets and spending roughly 4% a year of those assets... In theory, that can support a long retirement. And I think that can happen for several reasons. One of them is most investors are aiming for returns that exceed 4% a year, right? I think that is a fair statement for Americans thinking about their investments, whether they're in the workplace now or if they're thinking about being retired or if they are retired, right? So in theory, if you spend 4% a year, and your annual returns are in excess of 4% a year, perhaps significantly so, in theory, you have a perpetual money-making machine, and that 4% rule of thumb works and works really well, right? You'll never run out of money if you're growing your money. And by the way, if you run many simulations of the 4% rule, that actually is a fairly common outcome, is that the money grows as opposed to depletes. But there are risks involved in that. We'll talk about those risks. Yeah. And and one of the things that I wanted to maybe just spend just a second on is talking about inflation. Inflation is something I think is kind of top of mind for people right now. And I think inflation is running a little hot at the moment. And when you talk about that 4% rule, how does that account for inflation and potentially loss of purchasing power? Great question, Jonathan. So it is speculative, but here's a few things to keep in mind, right? Stocks and inflation are not perfectly correlated, right? We cannot say that having a stock portfolio or a bond portfolio perfectly offsets inflation risk. However, think about what inflation is, right? Inflation is simply the decline in the value of a currency. That means, you know, eventually asset prices are going to catch up with inflation, you know, on average. So, yeah, today it might be that we're having inflation and stock market declines. But in the future, because of the decline in the value of the dollar, at least in theory, asset prices should rise to catch up to that. So at least in theory, over long periods of time, inflation should not be that much of a detriment to the 4% rule, but it is out there as as one of the risk factors. 
So Sean, I actually have a question about, so as you said, everybody is looking to exceed a 4% return, right? And I, mean, I would say most people, right? right? You know, if if you came to me and you said, "Hey, Sean, I've got a hundred million dollars and I live on a hundred thousand a year," right? <laughs> I might say, say capital preservation. That's the only thing we're interested in. We don't care about total return. Let's get a negative return. We just want to preserve your capital. But okay. for ninety nine point nine percent of the audience, I think it's a fair <laughs> assumption that they're probably looking for more than a four percent return. But hey, you, your mileage might vary. Yeah, you do you. I love it. Love the <laughs> clarification. Thank you. That's wonderful. So, okay. But let's just talk conceptually because I, I think this is kind of lost in the weeds sometimes. So let's assume that there's no inflation, some preposterous thing, right? And you have $40,000 of annual expenses. You have, therefore, multiplied by 25, you have a million dollars of financial assets. And I also do want to ask you a question about that because you use that term. But you had a million dollars, right? And like you said, let's say you got an 8% return, but you're only withdrawing 4% every year, assuming no sequence of return risk. Let's just assume this was a straight 8% return. Your money is going to grow forever and you're going to end up with way more than the million dollars by definition. But as it's built in, or at least my understanding, and this is where I want your clarification, is built into the 4% rule of thumb is assuming for a normal inflation. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about current inflation, which is higher. But let's say you got an 8% return and again, just assuming kind of like a straight line, right? Which I know is not realistic, but an 8% annual return, you have 4% that you're withdrawing every year. And then there's a couple of percent for inflation, let's say three or four, just to make it easy, we'll say four. Can you talk through the nuance of, okay, you can actually withdraw a little bit more than that 40,000 every subsequent year to account for inflation, but what will that mean? In this hypothetical, which again is not realistic, but a hypothetical, what would that mean for the balance of your financial assets? Great question, Brad. And we have to then think about the nature of inflation itself, right? Because inflation hits different assets different ways and different costs different ways. So let's go back to your example of 40,000, 4% rule, $1 million retirement financial asset value. If we assume a 3% inflation on their costs, in year two, the withdrawal is the original $40,000 times 1.03. That's the 3% inflation rate. By my math, go to my blog post. I believe it's up there. That's 41,200 of withdrawal in year two. Okay. In theory, the assets have grown also by the, you know, whatever the rate of return is, plus some additional inflation. In theory, like I said, that isn't guaranteed to happen because assets are not perfectly correlated with inflation. But in theory, inflation is going to be built into the returns as well. So, you know, that is a, a, an important nuance. But it, it essentially, the inflation should be hitting both sides, both the asset growth in retirement and the withdrawals in retirement. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. And it is important that everybody listening to this understands that the 4% rule is indexed for normal inflation. So it's built in. It's not that you can only take that $40,000 every single year for the next 50 years. It does go up by that, let's say 3% or whatever, maybe. So again, the nuance of that, we don't need to tick and tie every number, but it's important people understand that. So I guess my second clarifying question before we actually get into your article is referring to that that term financial assets. So you said you should have 25 times your annual expenses to reach this financial independence figure, right? But you said to have that in terms of financial assets. Now, a lot of people question this, like, okay, what actually is my FI number? Is it inclusive of my home equity? Is it inclusive of things that I can't tap? Or is it just my investable assets? And I guess, what would be your response to that? Great question. My response would be that it's those readily accessible assets that are financial assets. So that's generally stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, ETFs, What I would not include in that for the most part is what I refer to as personal use assets, right? So cars are not a 4%, sometimes I call them 4% assets or financial assets. Cars, not a 4% asset. Primary residence, right? Your house is not an ATM, at least under normal conditions. We'll talk about that. So your primary residence and your cars, and then where I think people also get caught up in the weeds is rental real estate. So what is rental real estate? It's not a personal use asset and it has financial return to me. I view rental real estate for most in the FI movement as sort of a stream of income. So it's a rental stream of income 
that would, in theory, reduce the amount you would need to withdraw from your 4% assets, right? So if you have a rental property and it cash flows positive, say $1,000 a month, that's 12,000 of income a year, you know, just take that off the top of what you would have to withdraw from your 4% financial assets. Okay. So in that case, you're saying just from a real high level conceptual for somebody listening, you would actually just net that with your expenses, right? So let's say your annual expenses were that 40 grand. And in this case, you said a thousand dollars a month, you netted positive Cash flow. So that's $12,000. So your actual expenses that you needed to cover then would be 28000 in that case, right? And you'd multiply that by 25. And the same would hold true for somebody with a pension as well, right? It's the same exact concept. Right. Yes. It just kind of comes off the top. Okay. That is awesome. I think that's really, really important background information before we dive into the real nuance of your article. I love that. I love that. So, okay. So we have a basic foundation for the 4% rule, what it is. We've kind of talked, and this was a very important additional variable to consider is how is the 4% rule uh, accounted for by inflation? And my understanding is we didn't, they just randomly come up with this 4% as the percentage. They actually looked at inflation throughout all of our recorded, you know, stock market history that we've had access to these tools. And based on inflation through all these scenarios, they look to see what percentage would give you a success rate. And we could talk about what success was, but give you a success rate in 95 plus percent of all scenarios, you know, in all these different inflationary environments, including the 70s and 80s, which, and, and that number came back at the 4% rule, 4%. You could reliably pull down 4%. And what that was based on then is then when you go back and you look at the market on average produced around a 5% in real return over long periods of time. And that produced a scenario where ever, you know, you had enough money to last year into life. And in a lot of scenarios, you had more than when you started. I don't know if it was every scenario, but in a lot of scenarios, you had more than when you started. So the 4% rule is tested throughout all of these time periods. And so then you build on that, okay, all these unique income variables. And that really tees us up for us to have the much more nuanced conversation of four additional backstops to the 4% rule that you have not considered. So Sean, this is a wonderful article you put together. Where should we start? So I want to start with two concepts. One is an early retiree. The primary focus of the article is early retirees. This is not, hey, I'm leaving my job at age 70, right? There's some stuff in the article for you, but this is for people mostly in the FI movement who are thinking about retiring early by conventional standards. And then the second thing is I wanted natural backstops. So this is not, hey, I'm going to retire at age 40, travel the world for five years, and then come back at age 45 and work 2,500 hours a year, right? That's not what this is about. These are natural backstops. These are backstops that I believe most people in the FIRE movement would enjoy quite naturally, all right? And the first of those is your annual expenses. And Michael Kitsis has made one of these points before, and that is you're not just going to march off the cliff, right? The 4% rule, is a, it's a great academic study and research, but it sort of assumes uniform spending. It just assumes we're going to spend 4% a year and increase it by inflation. And we're just going to do that like a robot and there's never going to be any adjustment. So as a practical matter, we know that when things start going south in the stock market, folks hear about it, right? It's, you know, it's sort of in the zeitgeist, it's in the media, it's on the internet and folks make adjustments and these are not radical adjustments. So what I mean by that is maybe instead of doing an international vacation for nine days during your early retirement, you do a domestic vacation for seven days. Or instead of a $25,000 kitchen model next month, we do a $20,000 kitchen remodel you know, a year from now. Or instead of a Camry, we get a Corolla, right? There are these little adjustments in terms of our expenses in early retirement that we can essentially reduce our expenses and not have that radical an impact on our early retirement. So that's the first flavor of this expense reduction. The second one is even more natural. And that is, as you get older, your expenses are going to naturally decline, mostly as your energy declines. So let's think about this. You're 80 years old. Are you going to take a 12-hour flight to the tropics for the first time in your early 80s? The answer is no. Think about when you were a kid and you'd go over to your grandparents' house. Think about the furniture in that house. It was probably very, very dated. For Brad and me, it was probably from the 60s and 70s, (laughs) right, when we went to our grandparents' houses. And all the furniture's weird. And it wasn't because grandma and grandpa were impoverished. 
it's because they're, uh, you know, there's a country song, their give a damn was busted, right? When you're in your 70s and 80s and the couch cushions are a little frayed, you are not hopping online and saying, hey, what's the latest and greatest couch model? Your spending just sort of naturally declines in many cases as you get a little older. And so the 4% rule, you may not need 4% when you're 81, 82 years old and the couch is 20 years old and it's just good enough. It's not worth the hassle to go down to Macy's to buy a new couch. You know, it's funny, Sean, as you were saying that I had uh, two things came to mind. One is just this past week, I had the opportunity. I was looking at some statistics that showed actually during 2020 when the pandemic hit and everybody made changes to their, was forced in many cases to make changes to their lifestyle. The spending rate in the United States went from like an average 20 year average of around six to 7% up to around 16 to 17%. The actual, the savings rate inside the United States, like more than doubled. So, you know, just to prove your point, you know, it's not that you necessarily, we can, we are capable of making changes in a pretty aggressive manner if we need to, to our savings rate. So that, you know, you're not just locked in to one set number of expenses in a scenario where you have to, you can reel it in. And then the other was, uh, I was watching this Tony Hawk documentary the other day and the dude's in his fifties and still doing like half pipes and five forties <laughs> and stuff. And I was like, <sighs> I set the bar pretty high. <laughs> if he's still alive in his seventies, he'll probably still be going down stair rails and stuff on that skateboard. <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up though, Jonathan, about, okay, doing high risk activities that probably most of us are not doing that in our seventies or eighties. But I think what somebody listening to this might say is, okay, Sean, that makes sense about cutting a lot of your discretionary spending, but aren't healthcare costs going to go up dramatically? Are there things and, and that's the obvious one, right? That's the low hanging fruit. But what would be your response to that? And are there other things that you would anticipate would go up slightly or significantly? So it's absolutely possible that medical expenses could go up in the future as you're elderly. A uh, few thoughts on that. One, in the United States, you actually have guaranteed health insurance. You have Medicare. Okay. So that is some financial protection against increasing medical expenses. Second, sadly, sometimes it's you get ill and you pass, and we'll talk about that a little later, right? But it may be that you have a immediate medical situation, and then sadly, you pass, and so you don't have as much time to accrue these long-term medical expenses. It does happen to some folks, absolutely, where their medical expenses will increase. But I think for many, that will be offset by so many other factors that ultimately, your costs will go down in, in retirement not up as you age for most, not all, right? Again, there are no guarantees in this, but I think for many, it'll be the case that costs go down, not up overall. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I think in terms of the medical costs, like you said, there are programs, government-sponsored programs for people of a certain age, but also this is kind of a larger, transcends a larger conversation just in the FI community about, oh, but what about health insurance? What about healthcare? And I feel like it's a point of, Frustration, obviously, understandably, but people like to throw their hands up as if it could be an unlimited amount of money. And like, I think about my health insurance, and sure, it's very expensive for the premiums, but I look at it as catastrophe prevention in essence. And then there is a limit for what I can pay out of pocket each calendar year. I mean, it's a large number, it's like $14,000 for my family, but it's finite, right? So it's knowable. Again, this is not germane to our conversation at hand necessarily. But I think it is important that we look at, okay, this is a line item. It's a line item we wish we didn't pay. And, you know, you could go down that road, but it's a, a bad thought exercise in essence. Like, what does it get you? It's just, it is a line item. Well, and I think, Brad, you make such a great point about it's about maximum exposure financially. We've conflated in this country healthcare coverage with healthcare insurance. The insurance is just a financial product. And these days, generally speaking, between the Affordable Care Act medical insurance and Medicare, retirees, early or not, generally have guaranteed issue, which means that there's a cap on how much out-of-pocket, generally speaking, you can pay. So yes, it is frustrating. The systems are terrible in terms of signing up for these things. You know, This is not, hey, just pull out your phone and in five minutes you have health insurance, but it is very navigable. It's manageable. And I think all of us probably know some elderly relatives who have had very lengthy hospital stays. I know I do. And the bills just aren't that much, especially if they're at least age 65, right? If they're before age 65 and they don't have health insurance, that could be a whole other thing. But if they've got coverage, 
you know, yes, you'll see some huge, you know, I, I know in my own experience, I've seen six figures, not for myself, but for at least one relative, I've seen six figures on a bill, but that's not what they ultimately pay, not, nothing close to it, right? So it's daunting, but it can be overcome and can be managed. So in terms of the four backstops to the 4% rule, the first one we just talked about is spending. And we talked about there's different aspects to what that could mean. One is just flexibility. You know, you have the ability to make adjustments. You're not locked in to like, oh, I said it was a 4% rule. So I need to withdraw this amount every year. One, your personal inflation rate may not be totally synced up with what the economy is experiencing. Two, the difference between your discretionary spending and your structural spending may allow you to make, you know, small moves one way or the other that really have no discernible impact on your quality of life or what it is that you're able to do. And then on top of that, we talked about the other nuance there. And this goes to that concept that I think, uh, I'm trying to think who, Root of Good was the first person I ever heard use this term at a talk at a camp by in Mid-Atlantic. And he called it the retirement smile, which Sean is what you're kind of talking about as well. This after you retire, a lot of your costs actually go down. You pay off the mortgage, the mortgage expense goes away. You had your kids in school, you need to go get clothes and all these other things. And now they're not dependents and you don't need to provide as much for them. You know, just there's a lot of costs that are associated with living life that for a period of time go down. And it's called a smile because it goes down. And then at end of life, it comes back up. And, you know, you were addressing a little bit of the nuance of that. I'm going to add in one little piece here. And this is we did just to add some flavor. And if people are really interested in really dialing in a plan around flexible spending rules for early retirees, we did a fantastic episode. It still stands up well with Michael Kitsis. It was episode 172 of our podcast in which we actually took a look at an early retiree who retired right as the pandemic was striking and investments, as you know, right at the, right in March, the stock market was going down and they had just pulled the early retirement trigger. And we talked through a hypothetical scenario of how they might want to adjust their strategy based on what ended up happening. And it ended up being a V and just went straight back up, but it was still useful for that thought exercise. And it might provide you some value as well. Listening to this. So Sean, I just wanted to add on that was spending. You want to take us into the next backstop? The next backstop is social security. And this actually works out really well for the early retiree. So when I say early retiree, I mean early by conventional standards and generally before age 62. So think about somebody in their 50s, they retire and they no longer work. And their only means of support are 4% rule assets, financial assets, right? So they've got a pile of financial assets, 1 million, 2 million, whatever it is. They take 4% you know, every year and they adjust for inflation, these sorts of things. If you're age 55, you're age 50, you're age 60, and you early retire, you have no social security income whatsoever, right? You're constrained, say, if you use the 4% rule, that's it. 4% rule and there's no social security. Well, that turns out to be a feature, not a bug, because here's what happens. At age 62 or later, we can talk about some nuances there, right? But you know, you're living on your 4% assets. Great. You know, things are going well in the stock market or not so well. And then at some point in your 60s or at age 70, a social security check comes in, right? In theory, under the 4% rule, the social security check is the Vegas money. In theory, it's just adding on, hey, I'm living on 4% of my assets and it's going well for 90 plus percent of the population, hopefully. And so now I've got Vegas money and it's just additional income that isn't even budgeted for in the 4% rule. But if the 4% financial assets aren't doing so well, great. Now I've got a backstop, right? I've got social security coming in, providing 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 a month. And that can make up a significant piece of any gap that my financial assets are causing because of downturns in the stock or bond markets. Yeah. When you're talking about social security, uh, this is one that a lot of us, especially people that are, are, you know, really have their eyes on reaching financial independence in their thirties or forties, they tend to write it off. We don't actually incorporate it into our financial planning and all, but it is a reality. As long as you hit some level, I think there are some triggers at which point you're eligible for it. And maybe you could speak to that. Cause if you only worked for one year and then you were out, you have no work history. It's probably not going to be, um, a big check that hits the mail when you're 65. Yeah. So generally speaking, in order to qualify for social security benefits, my understanding is you have to have, they call it 40 quarters, which is a fancy way of saying 10 years of an earnings history. Now it's going to be very hard to build up FI assets for most people in the FI community without working for at least 10 years. So I think that's generally a given 
that most early retirees are going to qualify for a social security benefit at some point in the future. Then the issue becomes, well, haven't I diminished that benefit because I retired early? And the answer is yes, but, and there are two very significant buts. The first one is social security is progressive in terms of how it pays out future benefits. It values your early earnings much more than it values your later add-on earnings, right? Your marginal earnings when you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s tend to be less valued in terms of future social security payouts than those earnings in your teens, 20s, 30s when you were just starting out your career, right? So that's an important point. Yes, you're going to diminish that social security check, but maybe not as much as you think. And I actually have a blog article about that, early retirement and social security and what the practical effect of one more year of work is in your 50s. Does it really add that much to the annual benefit? The second thing is, like I said, it's just a backstop, right? When you retire early with the 4% rule, you're essentially budgeting zero for Social Security by default, right? You don't even have a choice. And then if you get an additional dollar every year from Social Security, it's a backstop. So yes, it matters in terms of, hey, yeah, I'm going to reduce my benefits a little bit here. But boy, it can still be a very significant backstop very naturally for early retirees. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that none of us or very few of us, let's say, I don't want to say none, but very few of us in the financial independence community do include Social Security in any type of future, certainly 4% rule or even like we talked about before, netting your annual expenses with a pension or with your real estate income. I don't know why that is, frankly, but maybe it's the control what you can control type scenario of, okay, we have control over our annual expenses. We have control over what we've saved and we almost don't consider this. Do you have any thoughts on that? So a few thoughts. One, social security should be a complement to your retirement savings, not your primary retirement savings vehicle, right? It can be if it comes down to that, but that's not what we're looking for, particularly in the FI community. Second thing is, If you're retiring in your 40s or 50s, you're not factoring in Social Security for the practical reason of if I leave my job today and I need to live and put food on the table tomorrow and next month and next year, the payout from Social Security will be zero. That's a pretty powerful incentive not to include it. But to say it doesn't exist when in your 60s and certainly in your 70s, you absolutely can collect a Social Security check is not realistic, right? We're we're trying to do with this 4% rule is be realistic. And I think we have to bring back Social Security into that conversation. And yes, there's some risk around the future of the program. I will say in the past, Social Security taxes were lower than they are today. So I think I think the risk probably exists more for future workers in terms of what future tax rates on Social Security are going to be in terms of collecting FICA taxes. Reducing payouts significantly is not a good way to get reelected, right? This isn't a political show, but we'll do politics 101, right? And if folks are collecting 2000 3000 a month on Social Security and that gets halved or more, I wouldn't bet on those politicians getting reelected, <laughs> right? Well, and let's talk about the reality of that is a lot of people do their retirement planning around their Social Security check. So if you start messing, yes, as terrifying right, as right. that is, you start messing with that retirement plan, that de facto retirement plan, and um, you're going to shake some bees out of the hornet's nest for sure. No, that's a great point, Jonathan. And I love how this kind of ties into that concern that I voiced from the spending from part one, which is to your point, clearly, I think a lot of your spending is going to go down as part of backstop number one. But again, people have this concern about health insurance or health care, whatever we want to call it. But even if you just include, okay, I'm at FI just from my financial assets, I'm going to get social security. Even if you just mentally appropriate that for this potentially fictional or not as significant health insurance, health care, okay, then that's not too bad. It's hard to imagine that being two to $3,000 a month, again, for 98 plus percent of people. Obviously, they're always the horror stories, but we're talking about the vast, vast majority of people. So again, my comment doesn't really have all that much pertinent to respond to, Sean, but a lot of money is psychological. And if people can just say, right, like, okay, that may go up, but, oh, I have all this money coming in that I haven't even accounted for. Well, and think about, too, like, what are you afraid of, right? So let's say there is a bad medical situation after retirement, okay? 
one, you know, at age 65, you have Medicare. Two, you know, between Affordable Care Act and other options, there's essentially guaranteed issue, right? So there's generally a ceiling on that stuff. And then three, if you do have one of these medical situations, guess what? Travel's probably going down, right? A lot of other things are probably going down because the medical situation is going to preclude a lot of other expenses, right? If your medical situation's in a really bad shape, you're probably not going to the Mets game on the weekend. You're probably not staying at a five-star luxury hotel. There are different things that will go down because the medical went up. So is everything risk-free in this analysis? No, but I think there are stop gaps and fallbacks, even on this medical thing. And remember with the 4% rule, the hope in theory is our assets are actually going up, not down. So in theory, we're going to have asset appreciation that could finance any additional medical costs, right? In theory, again, so what we're trying to do is put all the risks and all the possible upsides on the table here. All right, guys, we're talking with Sean Mullaney, the Phi tax guy, about the four backstops to the 4% rule. We'll talk about the next backstop right after this. Now, back to the show. All right, guys, going through the four backstops to the 4% rule. Sean, what's the next backstop we're going to talk about today? The next backstop is your own primary residence, right? So most early retirees, not all, most own a primary residence and have either significant equity in it or fully own it outright, okay? So what happens is you go into early retirement and you own your home. And hopefully you just live off these 4% financial assets and things are going great. Okay. But what if they don't go so great? Well, you have an asset you can tap into and you can tap into it different ways. So if the stock market really declines and all of a sudden your financial assets are depleting, what you could do is sell your primary residence and move into a smaller condo or rent an apartment or move to a lower cost of living area. And all those things might be sort of in accord with your retirement plans and desires anyway. So for example, maybe you retire and you got a 2,000 square foot home, and then you're getting into your 70s and 80s and you're like, oh boy, maintaining 2,000 square feet, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe I just want to move into a 1,000 square foot condo, less maintenance, and I, you know, I sell the 2,000 square foot home, buy a 1,000 square foot condo or rent it and pocket the difference and put the difference into the 4% rule right? So there are these ways that your primary residence, as your needs change, can sort of naturally become a financial asset. The last one is a reverse mortgage, right? So that's where you take equity out of your primary residence and stay in it. There are financing costs involved with that. It's not the best option for all people, but it too is just another option, another tool in the toolbox where your primary residence can help finance your retirement and help make sure that you are financially successful. So this is really interesting. I, I like the flavor you've added on this because, you know, on the one end you would say, okay, well, you know, can I account for the principal that I have in my mortgage? Can I account for that in my, you know, in my investments, in my total net worth to the degree that it's not going to be a part of the 4% rule? You would say, you know, well, are you planning on living there after retirement? But there's more nuance in that, that you don't necessarily need to like account for but it should give you some confidence that the 4% rule of thumb is good enough because, you know, we just talked about the spending factor. We just talked about the social security factor. Here we are talking about this property that you own, that you do have principal. And, and it's not that it needs to be this extreme change in your plans, but rather it might actually complement your plans. You were planning on potentially downsizing anyways. You know, as everybody over 60 suddenly starts to see the appeal in the ranch home. It's just a weird thing. I've started to notice that my ankles are a little tight going down the stairs in the morning. I kind of get it. Not quite, but kind of. And then on top of that, and this is really interesting. I want to spend just a second there. The reverse mortgage. I'll be honest. I used to you know, have the financial news on the background. And I mean, just reverse mortgage commercial after reverse mortgage commercial. It's pretty easy to just blanket statement. That's a scam. Like if it's being shown that often, it's like, a, you know, mesothelioma commercials. I mean, it's like Lowell the Hammer Stanley and then this, that's it. Those are your two options. But you're saying in the right context with the right mindset, there might be a time and place to consider that as a compliment to your plans. I'd love to hear you spend another two minutes on reverse mortgages and how you've seen them be used effectively. Yeah. And I will say I am not an expert on reverse mortgages, but I don't believe they are a scam. You know, they're in federal law in terms of how these things work, right? 
And I will say they're also, they're advertised, I think, because there's a certain segment of the population that qualify for reverse mortgages that tend to watch certain programs that advertisers can reliably guarantee, oh, we're going to have so many people over age 62 in this television audience, right? Those Um, avocado toast millennials are so easy. (laughs) (laughs) So what it is, it's a financing arrangement, just like a mortgage is, where you're taking cash out of the home but staying in the home. So that's why it's a reverse mortgage as opposed to getting cash to acquire the home. You're essentially giving some of that equity to the bank and giving the bank rights with respect to your home if you were to leave the home or if you were to pass. It's a way of drawing down the equity on the home when you own the home and you want to keep living in it. It's not at all necessary if you're like, hey, I want to downsize or I'm going to move or anything like that then you don't need to worry about a reverse mortgage. But essentially, it's great in situations where your financial assets are not doing what they need to be doing and you want to stay in the home. So it's the scenario where, hey, you know, Sean's saying, hey, we could downsize and we can move to Del Boca Vista or rent a place or whatever it is. I don't want to do that. I want to stay in my home. Well, then the reverse mortgage tool comes into play. So it's not my go-to. It's not like, oh, everybody should be doing a reverse mortgage but it's just another one of these security blankets, another one of these tools in the toolbox where you could stay in your own home and acquire financial assets to succeed financially. Yeah, certainly something to look into. Again, that's something I don't have much direct knowledge of reverse mortgages, but like you said, this is not a fly-by-night thing necessarily. It is, you said it's federal law, like this is a legit thing, obviously with the caveat that there can be significant fees, you need to look into the precise program Oh, absolutely. You need to shop around 100%. And yes, there absolutely can be fees to it. And like I said, not my go-to plan at all, but it's one of those things that it's out there and it can be the right answer. You know, you have to have the right profile. The profile is the financial assets are not doing well. If your financial assets are doing well, they're supporting you or one of these other backstops is supporting you. Yeah. Do not be doing a reverse mortgage in most cases. But if the financial assets are not supporting you adequately and you want to and can stay in the home, then the reverse mortgage becomes a tool to very much consider. No, that makes sense. And I I wanted to drill down actually on probably the more pertinent examples or maybe the ones that that you might recommend more because you went through them. But I think it's important just to give a little extra flavor. So on your article here, you give an example, and I, I think it's a pretty reasonable one. So there are two different options, in essence, that you laid out. Obviously, there, there are more than that in the world. But let's just talk through the, the two that you did. So you have a $500,000 house. You decide, hey, I want to downsize. So you actually go to a smaller place, but one that happens to be less expensive also. So you buy a new house. And we're not going to talk about closing costs and commissions and all this stuff. But just you sold the house for 500000 So you had no mortgage. And you bought a new house for 350000 Again, you pay for it in cash from that five hundred. So you have no mortgage also, but now you have $150,000 that is deposited into that quote unquote financial assets, right? So just looking at the 4% rule, that's an extra $6,000 a year that you can spend just off of that money. It's an extra $6,000 a year, at least initially, and it actually might be more. So let's say the person doing that is 84 years old. Are we going to tell them they're constrained by 4% (laughs) at age 84? No, we're not, right? So that's another reason why this is such a powerful backstop, right? It might be, hey, you got $150,000, you're age 84. I mean, maybe we're talking about a 10% rule in that case. Who knows what we're talking about? So yeah, I I think it is a very powerful backstop. And like I said, you you may be in that 500,000, 2,000 square foot home for reasons that apply to your life back in your 30s and 40s. In your 80s, those reasons almost certainly do not still apply. And you're, you might be very likely to want less square footage, just l- less to maintain. And then that also reduces heating and cooling costs. It might reduce property taxes. There are all sorts of ancillary benefits that can be obtained by downsizing the real estate in retirement. Yeah, I love that explanation, Shauna. And that ties so perfectly into the next example, which is just simply you have that same $500,000 house and you sell it. And you move into a rental, right? An apartment or some such. But in your case, it's interesting. And again, that explanation is so perfect because I think somebody with the phi lens of, oh, I'm in my 30s or 40s might look at your article slightly differently in that, okay, I sold my $500,000 place, pocketed that money, but then I moved into a $2,000 a month apartment. So that's $24,000 a year. And you say, 
oh, the math doesn't line up, right? And this is with no analysis, obviously, but the 500K, you take 4% of that, that's 20,000. And now you're telling me I just committed to spend 24,000. But as you so appropriately said, this is for somebody in their 70s or 80s who I think the break even on that would be like 22 years. And they might not have 22 years. If you're 84, like you said, and you're thinking about doing this, you might look and say, oh, okay, I can enjoy this money. So I thought that was a really great flavor. And I will shut up now and, and let you respond. But that was a really important bit of nuance that I, that I wouldn't have gotten just from the article necessarily. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and, and you know, there are plenty of nuances. We can you know, peel this onion in layers and layers. But yeah, as you age, your 4% rule absolutely can go up, right? And again, the 4% rule is just a general rule of thumb. And there are different people out there. I mean, Bill uh, Bengen, I believe when he first came up with some of this research in the mid-90s was at a 5%. Morningstar last year came out at a 3.3%. And I think part of what we're saying here is, you know, is it 3.9%, 4.1%. All right, you know, let's not lose so much sleep over the exact number. Let's understand that there are risks, but there are things that mitigate those risks that is just not included in some of this research. So maybe we shouldn't be losing so much sleep over, oh, 4%, 3.5%, what is the right answer? And it's, that's especially true. What we're trying to think about is worst case scenarios. And look, if you're 40 years old, you early retire and the stock market just tanks, maybe you do have to go back to work. But what we're thinking about is the failures are more, much more likely to occur in later years, whether you retire in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So let's think about those later years and what those backstops look like. And that's why this real estate can be so powerful because you can monetize that real estate and not have 30 more years to live. Maybe you only have 10 more years to live. And that's actually a good segue into our fourth backstop. So what's interesting about, and we'll come directly into that fourth backstop, but as you were saying it, you're saying the failures occur in your later years, but, and I would say this is an important, but the, the bigness signal of whether that failure is going to occur in those later years is what happens in the years immediately following you walking away from your income stream. And we, we call that sequence of return risk. And, you know, quite simply, you walk away from your job. What happens over those first five years when you're drawing down on your assets will be the biggest highlight or indicator of whether or not you will be a failure or success 15, 20 or, or 30 years from now. And so that's worth looking into and exploring a little bit further. But, but then the one thing to add on to that is like when people are talking about a 5% rule of thumb or a 3.3% rule of thumb or a 4% rule of thumb, and you made this point brilliantly, I want to add a little flavor. It's because we're trying to pick one number to rule them all, right? It's just the one number for all scenarios and all times. If you just do this, it's going to be great. If you can instead understand the why of the number that you're picking, what affects it, what defensive posturing you can take in terms of the variables that you can you know, influence, which is what we're talking about right now, it could very well be a 5% rule for you with adjustments down or up based on what happens. You're not locked in. So as you get more aggressive and intentional about mapping out, charting your own destiny here, it's worth spending some time to understand that it's not just a number. It's a best guess based on what you're willing to compromise on and how flexible you're willing to be. And if you can understand those, you can move that number around. So we've talked about three. Sean, let's finish on a warm, fuzzy note. What is the fourth backstop? The fourth backstop is your own mortality. Oh, that's awkward. <laughs> yeah, your own mortality, which is a fancy way of saying you're going to wind up in the ground. I said warm and fuzzy, Sean, warm and fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. So guess what? You are ultimately going to pass, right? And when we do retirement planning, it's often, okay, you're going to pass at age 95. And so we got to plan out till age 95. There are tables out there. If you're in your 40s now or your 50s now, you have a not statistically insignificant chance of sadly not making your 80s or even your 70s, right? So when we're thinking about the 4% rule, it's not about will it last for 30 or 40 years? It's about will it last the rest of my life? And what is the rest of my life? And there are scenarios where the rest of your life sadly is not 30 years. It's not even 20 years. So why are we being so conservative when this is out there as a real risk that you know maybe the money lasts, but you don't? So we can't just say with 
blinders on that, oh, we're all making 95. And so we all must always plan to age 95. Yes, it's a possibility and we hope we make it to 95. But sadly, there are going to be folks who die in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so this question of will the financial assets last for 30 years, 40 years, may be very academic for some people in the FIRE movement. Hate to break that news to you, right? So you have to think about probabilities of failure. And failure only happens if two events occur, not if one event occurs. The first event is running out of financial assets. And the second event is living long enough to run out of financial assets. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to carry that one forward because none of us like make a lot of plans around dying early. It's, you know, talk about things that are not in your control. I definitely don't want to influence that and make that more likely. But having said that, I think the point there is like, if the math work, I mean, it's a reason that you should be more confident about the 4% rule of thumb. I think that's really the heart of this. It's not that you're going to take it, you do any advanced math on this. Well, I could, there's a 30% chance I could die. So maybe I'll eat more broccoli. No, it's just rather you control what you can control. If you understand, again, the nuance of what's going into this calculation, realize that like just the fact that you probably aren't going to make it to that upper 1% of people that live the longest because they're practicing the Wim Hof method. Like that's probably going to make your number that you were drawing, you could be even more confident about that number. You know, there's times where I actually spend like two minutes uh, explaining a thought and then I realized that I didn't help anybody anywhere. And this was, this was one of those points in time. No, no, no. Do a better job than I did. (laughs) I think the kernel of truth in there, which is what you're trying to get at is that we should probably feel a little more hopeful about the 4% rule. I think a lot of us are the type A kind of warriors plan for everything. Certainly I'll speak for myself, uh, you know, recovering type A is like, I think about the worst case scenario. So I'm always looking for, you know, again, like someone like Big Earn is brilliant and he's run every single scenario. And I think the last we heard, and it might have been updated, was like 3.25% safe withdrawal rate will get you as close to 100% chance of success as possible. But I think what we're saying here, okay, that's the worst case. But Sean, with the backstops and the flexibility It sounds like, and I know you're a conservative accountant who doesn't like to make grand pronouncements, but it sounds like you're actually probably more okay with the 4% rule of thumb than maybe many people in the FI community might be. Yeah, I I think that's a fair assessment, right? So that's an opinion. That's not advice for you (laughs) or anyone else in the audience. So without giving any advice for anyone in the audience in terms of their particulars, I think there's been just too much agonizing and gnashing of teeth over well, it can't be 4%. It's going to be 3.5%. Because what, what I, my mind goes to is, well, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, we can run these Excel spreadsheets, but we have to play it out. What happens? And what we have to think about is financial failure. That's all we have to think about. We don't have to think about getting a 10% return or 12% return from the stock market. If we get a 1% return and we don't fail, then it's fine. And so what I'm saying is, well, wait a minute, let's play it out. Well, you're getting social security you're not just going to spend 4% blindly. And in fact, as you get older, you're going to spend less because you're older and you don't have that sort of energy to. It just seemed to me that the conversation, I'd say two things about the conversation. One, it got a little too academic and a little too spreadsheet focused. And then second, and this the second one I think is, is very natural, but it sort of decided instead of planning around average scenarios, it planned around worst case scenarios that the worst case became the anchor as opposed to the average, right? The worst case is I'm going to live to 95. And so I need every last dollar I can get. And the stock market's going to have the sequence of returns risk. And, you know, everything's going to be terrible in the first five years of my retirement. I mean, we actually just played that out. Think about March of 2020, folks lost 30% of their portfolio values. You know, that was a common scenario. And sequence of returns risk, aren't you, you know, in a, a big trouble? Well, turns out most early retirees were not even in the March 2020 scenario. That doesn't mean every time the stock market goes down 30%, it's going to rebound as quickly as it did over the last two years. But I think it's just, I think, Brad, you're absolutely right that I am not as pessimistic about the 4% rule as many others are. I want to point to this fact that when we're talking about the early retiree in particular, in particular, you should never let one more year syndrome keep you in a toxic scenario because you're worried about whether it's a 4% rule or a 3.5 or 3.9 or what you should absolutely never like, think about it this way. If you cannot stand your job and you've hit 4% rule and you have any inclination, you should feel very confident 
just taking a step back, knowing that if you want at any point in time for any reason, you can just go back in. You can go back. You can go across the street to a competitor. You can get a second chance at getting the job that you wish with all of the benefit of hindsight that you have now that you had done the first time. You can always go back. You can always reenter the market and the market will, I mean, just based on what we have seen in this community, it will value you more highly than if you never left. You'll be able to design what you choose to go back into because you don't really need it. You don't need it, right? Because you'll kind of have that sense within just a couple of years of how things are going. And even then, just because you have a sense of how things are going, you probably have just because you had 4% or well, you probably have 10 to 20 years of assets invested, right? 10 to 20 years of expenses covered by your investments. You have the power on your side of the court. And you should just be aware. Today, we talked about the defense, but people think about you know early retirement as this one-way exit. It's a turnstile. Joel said this from 5180. It's a turnstile. And failure, your worst case scenario is just everyone else's every day. So, you know, take that and use it and channel it and start designing your future. Today, we're talking with the Phi Tax Guy. You can find him at phitaxguy.com. We we're talking about the four backstops, the 4% rule. Sean Mullaney, how can people connect with you and find out more? Thanks so much, Jonathan and Brad. Yeah, you can find me on my blog, phitaxguy.com, or at my financial planning firm website, mullaneyfinancial.com. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. 